Hi there, everyone who's here. Welcome to the June live event for Essential Vegan Desserts. I'm Fran Costigan, the director of Vegan Pastry at Ruby, and I absolutely love these live events. They give me an opportunity to choose a topic and interact with students, graduates, and guests. So I want to welcome you all and thank you for taking time out of your busy days to be here with me. I'm especially excited about today's event. I wonder if I say that every time, but really and truly, June is my favorite month or yeah, it's my favorite month. I try not to have a favorite. People ask me, what's your favorite dessert? And I say, well, that's like asking me who's my favorite grandchild, but I love June. June for me is the start of summer, which is without question my favorite season. I am a warm weather person. I grew up at the beach. I lived at the beach. And now in Philadelphia, <laughs> I look at the river, the Delaware River, which is great. So I love warm weather. I love the fact that June is filled with birthdays in my family, mine, my sons, my grandson, Eli. And in June, I get to go to Rancho La Puerta Spa in Tecate, Mexico as the guest cooking teacher. It's just a place that is absolutely wonderful. So in honor of June, I have attached an event document with lots of information that I think I hope that you'll find interesting and helpful about taking care of berries, one of our summer fruits, how to choose them, how to store them and how to use them, some other information as well, and a recipe for a mango mousse, that a mango cream actually, that I made for this event. This is a new recipe. You'll also find on the homepage of the event, a recipe doc document for fruit slump or grunt. And that is a recipe that is in essential vegan desserts, but it's just, it's a recipe you can make all year round and with any variety of fruit. Um, I tend to make it with blueberries this time of the year or mixed berries in the winter. I love making a pear cranberry um, recipe, a slump or a grunt. And why, you know, for people who aren't familiar, and I get this question a lot from students, both my students who live in the United States and international students say very often, that was delicious, but I never heard of a slump. It's a part of a family of early American desserts that were created, no doubt, to use up an abundance of fruit or fruit that was just getting ready to go off and so on. They're very thrifty. And in the event document, you're going to see some of the names. There's slumps, there's grunts, there's pandowdy, there's sonkers. Um, I put a link to an article that was in the New York Times oh, a couple of years ago about these kinds of desserts. This is a wonderful dessert to be able to make in advance because you do the fruit filling and you make a very quick topping that goes on to the fruit filling when it's hot. It doesn't It's a stovetop dessert, so you don't have to heat up your oven. And... Um, why is it called a slump or a grunt? Well, some people say the biscuit batter slumps into the filling and other people say the biscuits are heard grunting while they steam. It's a wet filling, much wetter, more liquid than you would find in a cobbler or crisps, for example, but the biscuits actually steam. So we're going to we're going to talk about that. You know, you get these mega flavor and mega health benefits with summer fruit. I actually think all fruit is healthful. In fact, I know it is, and I hope you do too. And the easiest way to think about eating healthfully is to eat the rainbow, eat all different colors. But we know that berries are especially 
healthy and I, you know, I really have standardized my breakfast year round. Otherwise I wouldn't eat breakfast and I eat steel cut oats with blueberries in the wintertime. I add frozen berries and cook them into my oatmeal and some flax and cinnamon. And that is very, very healthy and delicious. I mean, something can be healthy and not taste good. Chances are we're not going to eat it. So when I do the cashew cream or show you how to do it today, given that I'm talking about using the abundance of fresh fruit and some vegetables too, that we find in the marketplace, if you're in this hemisphere of the world right now, I also use some dried mango to make a fresh mango mousse. And there are a couple of reasons that I did that. Dried fruit and people who have taken or are in essential vegan desserts learn that fruit pastes are a really nice sweetener to use appropriately. Many of you probably know that dates are used as, you know, we make date paste and we can add that to a number of dishes. But I like a variety of dried fruit paste. I like mango. I am a fan as a chef Char Nolan of dried plums, which are and will always be to me still prunes because that's what they are. Dried fruit desserts or fruit desserts that or sauces or snacks that have some dried fruit in them, which will be hydrated, they are so naturally sweet because the sugars are concentrated. I do make sure to buy sulfite-free dried fruits, and then it's just really so good to go. So, you know, I'm going to show you, I have strawberries. Now, where I live in Pennsylvania and near New Jersey, we have a variety. It's called, what did Kathy Gold say to me? Uh, it, it's, there is tremendous, wonderful farms, family farms for fruit. These berries are very big. So they, and but they actually taste good. You know, we're going to adjust the amount of sweetener we use based on how our fruit tastes. Some are very sweet, some are not as sweet, and then we have our individual palates. But these berries are bred to ship. I use organic fruit. Um, I do pay attention to the environmental working group, Dirty Dozen and Clean 15, and strawberries have been for a number of years at the top of the list, as is kale, I'm sorry to say. The clean 15, the list of those fruits and vegetables, I don't worry about organic as much, but I do with berries. Now, these raspberries are local, and they came in this little container, it's the little hole in the top of the raspberry. Sometimes I put a little bit of chocolate ganache in there. And then of course I have blueberries, which I love. I took care of prepping. You know, my students or Ruby students in general know all about mise en place, which means getting everything together before you start. You may have nuts that have to be roasted and then cooled and chopped. Chocolate, in this course that has to be chopped and sauces that have to be allowed to thicken or whatever. Um, so what I wanna say is get your items together. This is a mango mousse that I'm going to talk about later. And for starters, I just wanna tell you a couple of things about berries. If you can buy local, buy local. We want to support the farmers and they really taste delicious. Look for berries with bright color. Don't worry about the shape or the size. And as I said, buy organic when possible. 
as soon as you get the berries home, pick through them. One bad piece of fruit. You've heard the expression, one bad piece of fruit spoils the whole bunch. Well, it's really true. And when it comes to strawberries, when I'm preparing them and taking the greens off, I save them, I save that little bit of strawberry and the greens and pop it into some filtered water and it makes a delicious strawberry flavored water that I sip sometimes with a little bit of lemon in it. I try not to waste food at all. Again, the amount of sweetener that's needed is going to depend on the relative sweetness of the fruit Less is always more unless you're doing a batter based dessert or a cake where you can't adjust with fruit desserts. You can adjust the flavor and there are ways to brighten the flavor of fruit that isn't perfection to you. That is not only by you don't have to only think about a sweetener to me, the best way to lift fruit desserts, or frankly, any food that I make, savory food too, is citrus, fresh citrus juice and citrus zest. That really lifts flavors. I also like with strawberries uh, to use a bit of a balsamic reduction that is slightly sweetened and has a little bit of lacuma in it. The lacuma has a slight woody flavor and this is an assignment that we do in essential vegan desserts we do a roasted fruit now i'm talking about fruit desserts but what about adding some vegetables to our summer fruit desserts tomatoes botanically speaking are a fruit right and i did make a crumble recently actually a cobbler <laughs> with raspberries and blueberries and tomatoes. Fewer tomatoes than the berries, but I cut them appropriately into, I tried to keep them the same size as the berries and it was delicious. Then, because I was so excited about that, I decided to add some yellow squash, or you could do it with a zucchini as well. And what I found was this by itself, as those of you who are eating this, and I love squash, um, needs some flavor. So I marinated it first and it was great. Don't forget, I have to walk over here. I am still loving my new kitchen. Those of you who've been following along on my journey don't forget to use fresh herbs too when you can this is flowering sage so if you're growing your own herbs um, then you really don't want to see this unless it's for the flowers but i picked this up at the farmer's market the other day and the flowers are edible smells delicious and this is flowering thyme as well so it will be all over my counter but these are really lovely additions to your fruit desserts. And a lot of fruit desserts are naturally gluten-free. You can make a gluten-free topping or you can just poach or grill or roast fruit and you have a lovely dessert. Now, let's see. I'm still, okay. So for example, it wouldn't be a live event for essential vegan desserts with me if I didn't have some chocolate on the plate. I have one small truffle. This is an or the orange sesame tahini truffle that I make. And I've got some raspberries, a little bit of the flowering sage, and a ganache dipped strawberry. And that would make a nice dessert. So Let's go back to the slump now, and I'm going to ask Patrick to roll the video on how you make the slump. Again, you have this recipe. To make this classic early American dessert, start by preparing the fruit. Here we are using blueberries, but any number of other ripe fruit can be used as well. Next, add the sugar. The amount of sugar will ultimately depend on the fruit being used, how sweet it is, 
and of course personal preference. The liquid is added next. Here we are using orange juice, but again, a variety of other liquids could be used instead. Even water can be used and or combined for the liquid component. Stir and then bring the mixture to a boil over medium heat, stirring occasionally. Once the mixture comes to a good boil, reduce the heat to low. Cover with the lid slightly ajar and let simmer for approximately five minutes while you prepare the biscuit batter. To prepare the batter, sift together the flours, baking powder, baking soda, and salt. You may find it easier to push the dry ingredients through the sieve using a rubber spatula. Also note, depending on the sugar used, you may find it easier to simply add it to the dry ingredients after they have been sifted. For the wet ingredients, add the oil, vanilla extract, and orange zest to the non-dairy milk and stir to combine. Next, pour the wet into the dry and gently fold the mixture together. Once the mixture just comes together like this, stop. You do not want to overmix the batter, otherwise you will encourage gluten development which would result in a tougher biscuit topping. Now, using two large spoons, carefully drop rounds of batter onto the surface like this. Once the surface of the fruit has been covered with a batter like this, cover the pot and let simmer for approximately 25 minutes, or until the biscuits are fully cooked through. When done, the biscuit should look and also feel firm to the touch. To finish, brush the surface with maple syrup and sprinkle with cinnamon sugar, if desired. Let the mixture sit for 10 to 15 minutes before serving. This will allow the fruit to cool slightly and thicken a bit. To serve the dish, simply spoon some of the fruit and biscuit topping into bowls, adding a bit more fruit if desired. Serve either as is or with a bit of cold, non-dairy ice cream for a nice contrast. Okay, now you have seen one of my absolute favorite desserts, slump slash grunt. Any fruit filling, make the fruit filling ahead. You can keep it warm or rewarm it before you make the biscuits. And those biscuits contain, or the biscuit batter, it's not really a biscuit, contain only two tablespoons of fat, oil. I say, you know, oil is fat. That's what it is. So whether it's butter or vegan butter or a vegetable oil, that's what it is. Only two tablespoons for probably eight servings. It's delicious, warm. Some people like it with some ice cream. Um, if you don't want to use the maple syrup to brush them, you don't have to. The blueberries tend to bleed into the batter, the biscuit topping, but I think that's part of its charm. And if you have some left over and it sits overnight the or even for a few hours the fruit filling marries with the biscuits and it becomes more like a buckle i see a question that i want to take right now from my friend and colleague and some of your instructors chef char nolan so char says chef fran when you read this note i will be teaching a live class. Oh, Shar is teaching a class in Philadelphia today. What are two quick and easy desserts that have little sugar? We're listening live to you today. Yo, hey, yo, South Philly. So Shar, very lightly sweetened dessert would be the slump that I just made or the fruit soup and salad, which I think you have eaten at my home. It is a fresh fruit that you juice or puree set with a very small amount of agar, 
which is vegetable gelatin. You can infuse the liquid with spices and herbs and then strain them out and chill them and serve it with ice. I call it fruit soup and fruit salad, heaps of fruit and a little bit of cream. So those are two of my favorite fruit desserts. I also would say that a strawberry dipped in a high percentage ganache is another quick and delicious dessert. You know, typically we dip fresh fruit in melted chocolate. I feel that by making a ganache, which is a particular percentage of chocolate, and I use obviously vegan chocolate, very high percentage, the higher the percentage of the chocolate, the less sugar is in that has been added to that chocolate and an amount of plant milk. So I feel that you're getting more protein. I hope that helps, Shar. Yo, South Philly. Everybody who has an opportunity to take a class with Chef Shar is really in for a treat. So I'm going to here, I'm going to take a couple more questions before I get to the mango mousse. Michael H has a question. And that is, do I have a favorite oatmeal cookie recipe to share other oatmeal treats to recommend? Well, I do have an oatmeal cookie that I like very much. It's not a very sweet and buttery oatmeal cookie. And it's in my first cookbook, More Great Good Dairy. It's got such a long name, More Great Good Dairy Free Desserts so Naturally. Um, I do use oats a lot in dessert and I use oat flour a lot. Oat, if oats are certified gluten-free, they're gluten-free. Now there is no gluten in oats. So if you are, anybody's confused as I was until I learned the reason, it has to do with cross-contamination, but there are companies that sell certified gluten-free oats. So I I have some packaged oat flour in my refrigerator, but I tend to make my own with rolled oats and I grind it. I grind the oats to a fine powder, but it's not as fine. It'll never be as fine as all purpose flour or whole wheat pastry flour. And I add some oat flour a particular percentage to some of my desserts. Oat flour is sweet naturally sweet and it adds some nice protein. So I use I use oats in a lot of my desserts, Michael, and also in making a crumble or a crisp topping, which you can do at once. You know, you have a fruit topping and then you add the crumble or crisp topping, or you can make that topping ahead, as I suggest in the course, we have a recipe for that, and then it's just, you bake it and it's ready for you when you're ready to go. Or you can make a make or purchase. When you make something, you know what's in it. You can be sure that the sweetener and the nuts and the seeds and whatever is in your granola is to your liking without junk that we too often find in packaged foods, but you can use granola on top of fruit, and that's really great. Louise C. has a question. She's asking, is there a tasty graham cracker crust I can make at, for some plant-based pie fillings? I've tried vegan gluten, vegan graham crackers, but they taste like cardboard. Well, I agree with you that vegan graham crackers, the ones I've tasted, haven't tasted very good and often they are loaded with sugar. And Louise, I can't give you the recipe because it is a proprietary recipe in Essential Vegan Desserts, the course, but there is a recipe for homemade graham crackers. And I will tell you that graham flour is a rather coarse whole wheat flour. In order not to have to go out and buy graham flour, I realized that by lightly toasting whole wheat pastry flour, I got a graham cracker type flour. So my graham crackers are 100% whole wheat. Now, Chef Shar has another question, and this is a very important question. 
so much so that I put a link that you will find in the Q&A to an article uh, from the, that I found in the National Institutes of Health. You know, when you're doing research, you have to be careful. You have to really look at the source. I hope you all know that. And particularly the same with recipes. You can't just like, oh, I found a recipe out in the universe there, the Twitterverse, or no, oh, I didn't mean to say that. So this was the NIH and it was the Cleveland Clinic. The World Health Organization is talking about this now. And so is Dr. Michael Greger, nutritionfacts.org. Michael, Dr. Greger had been a real fan of erythritol and he has taken that back. These non-sugar sugars, many of them are sugar alcohols, all non-nutritive sugars. I'm not just talking about the first iteration, the Splendas and I don't know what was in that pink thing, the pink packet somebody might remember. Those we knew were terrible for us pretty early on, but this new, this new group of non-nutritive sweeteners has been linked now to cardiac incidences and strokes and other issues. So Char, I would say for baking, it's a little tricky to use date paste and other fruit paste. You can try some applesauce. Um, I know that Char, you are an expert in whole food plant-based cuisine. And I know you've figured some things out, but use fruits that are sweet, like our beloved <laughs> prunes and dates and apricots and see what you can do with that. And then use some coconut sugar, which still has minerals and some fiber in it. It's not just about the sweetener. It's about everything else. When you're adding fiber to your food, you're slowing down the digestion of these sugars. Next month, I'm going to be doing, the topic is going to be yet another look at vegan sweeteners and sweeteners in general because it's such a big topic and things change and we want to get to what's real. These sweeteners are not necessarily interchangeable. So there's the link. Patrick put the link in the doc. It's to the NIH document about um, cardiovascular events. Now, before I continue with the rest of the questions, I'm going to ask Patrick to show a video on how to work with mangoes. So, Because mangoes come in a variety of colors, the best way to know if a mango is ripe is by its smell. If the stem of the fruit has a fragrant, fruity odor, then it's ripe. You can also apply a bit of pressure like this near the top. It should be firm, but give way slightly. Avoid those with bruised, dried, or shriveled skin like this. There are a few ways to prepare a mango, the easiest being to peel it and remove the pit. It is best to cut a bit off the bottom of the mango so that it sits flat. You can then slice it or dice it into cubes depending on the recipe. Another way which is nice is to leave the skin on and slice the mango into cubes and then turn the skin inside out. No matter how you cut or prepare them, mangoes are beautiful in color and rich in flavor. There you go. So one year um, at Rancho La Puerta when I was doing my cooking classes, my, I had a recipe where I was using mangoes and they are in an abundance at the ranch. Oh my gosh, the fruit, all the fruits and vegetables and herbs and edible flowers come out of the organic garden. So it's a splurge, but if you can get there sometime, it's worth it. And I watched as the chefs were just peeling these mangoes. And honestly, I had never done that. I just cut my mangoes and did the, you know, 
turn them inside out. Peeling them is really easy. So there are many different kinds of mangoes and I love mangoes. I like mangoes with lime. To me, they just go together. And this is mango that I broke down yesterday and diced and it was a lot more, but I couldn't help myself from eating so much of it because it's good. So you do have the actual recipe in the event doc for what I did. This is brand new, but I started with a base of soaked and drained cashews and I added an amount, a small amount of the liquid that hydrated the dried mangoes. And then clearly it wasn't enough to get these cashews going. I added some plant milk, I added some oatly, and then I kept tasting. I did not feel that I needed any sweetener. If you make this recipe and feel it needs to be a little sweeter, you can add a little maple syrup, you can add a little agave, always keeping in mind that if you're adding liquid, you're gonna take liquid away from somewhere else. So, I added to my taste more lime juice because I love it. And this cream was made yesterday and you can see it's pretty thick and it's yellow. Another thing that's really cool is that if you put this in the freezer in individual dishes, you're going to be eating like a mango creamy creamsicle, a sorbet. When I make a thick cream, in my Vitamix or a high, you know, your high speed blender, I find it impossible to get everything out of the bottom. And I even bought something. So sometimes I give suggestions on equipment. I can say that this thing I bought that's supposed to get to the under the blades is not worth it for me. But what I do when I'm finished blending something that's thick is I'll put some water or soaking liquid, depending on what I have blended, or milk, and just let the machine run. And then I have something to add to a cream if the cream needs to be thinned, or add to a smoothie for me, or a treat. Um, I did play, I just loved this cream so much. So I played around with it and I thought about different flavors. And I took a little bit when you are thinking about recipes, you don't start with the whole thing. I added some ancho chili powder. I don't care for spicy foods as my friends know, but I love the smoky taste of ancho. And then I thought it called for some more lime. And I thought that was just absolutely delicious. So since I'm the one, <laughs> that's going to eat this dessert later. After the live events, I kind of have fun. I think I'll put some on there. I'll put some. So, there we go. And more mango because I really, really want the fruit. And this is going to be really yummy. What I did, since this glass is so narrow, was I pushed the fruit down. I kind of crushed the fruit because I wanted to get a lot of fruit. And then I think that different textures make a dish interesting. And here I'm concentrating on healthy. So I decided to use some pistachio nuts, which I did not chop. I just wanted them like that. And this is going to be a really yummy, yummy, yummy dessert for later. That's for sure. Um, now, I think I'm going to take some more questions here because there are a number that are. I want to get to as many as I can. Linda L. has a question. I received a 130 gram jar of this beautiful honey that comes from beehives set on top of buildings in Montreal. Well, that's really nice. I want to use your single layer vanilla cake to make a honey cake. Calls for seven eighths cup of sugar cane. How could I do this? 
So this is a big question that Linda asks. I don't think she is aware of how much, how many riffs I can do on this. First of all, there are many vegans, I would say the majority of vegans who don't eat honey because honey is an animal product, strictly speaking. Now, in my cookbook, Vegan Chocolate, I wrote about it and I said, I saw a film called Queen of the Sun about beekeepers all over the world who were trying to save the bees. And um, it really made an impression on me. So I do buy some local honey for myself, not commercial honey. You, Linda is not talking about commercial honey, but Linda, you, Linda and all of you, you can't just use honey in a cake. All of the liquid sweeteners are different. They have not only different flavor profiles, but they have different properties. So you can't do that. You can't make the vanilla cake into a honey cake, switching out the granulated sugar for honey, even if you use less honey and use more, you know, more of something else, it's not going to bake right. But I put a link to my vegan honey cake in the Q and A. Now I will tell you that that cake, that cake is delicious. My family really likes it and my friends do, and it's pretty made in a bunt pan, but I make a vegan honey. I think that you could swap out your bee honey. <laughs> Mine is a bee less honey, but Linda, what I would do is cut the recipe by a quarter and see what you can do, make a cupcake and see how it works. So that's the answer. And that actually, Linda has another question about sweeteners. She wants to know, is there an existing chart for sweeteners available if we want to swap them, addressing the dry to liquid ratio as well? Well, you are going to find, if you Google that, you're going to find a lot of different charts and they're all going to be different. I can tell you that for sure. And there are very few, I haven't found one that's accurate. Um, it depends on the sweetener. We have a chart in, a, we have two charts in essential vegan desserts on swapping sweeteners. And the answer is always, always that you have to do a test. So one of the, you know, one of the tips that I can give people who are new to be vegan baking or remind people who are vegan bakers is choose your recipes wisely. Don't just pick up a recipe that someone told you about or look good to you and you don't know who wrote it and there are no comments on it. That's one thing. And another is when you are trying a recipe for the first time, particularly if it's someone, someone's recipe you don't know, it's not a chef or an author that you have confidence in, is to cut the recipe in half, maybe in a quarter, maintain the integrity of the dessert. So if it's a cake, make a cupcake or two, same depth of batter and see how that goes and see how that goes. Catherine has a question, are there Oh, this is another interesting question about converting. Are there any general rules for converting vegan recipes to be sugar-free and oil-free? Are there cases where this is impossible to do? Yes, there are cases where it is impossible to do. Our beloved aquafaba meringue, for example. So if there is anyone who hasn't heard about aquafaba, I wish you could raise your hand and tell me because um, that's pretty unusual today. But aquafaba is the liquid from cooked chickpeas. And I have people in the course tell me all the time, <laughs> they, I get emails, I couldn't get it right every single time your method works. So you whip this chilled and prepared reduced aquafaba with a bit of cream of tartar, tartar, which you would do with egg whites, and add some super fine vegan sugar, which you make by grinding 
organic vegan sugar that's one and the same generally speaking cane sugar to a powder and you whip it you can't do that if that is you can't make aquafaba meringue without sugar and there are some cakes that you can't do with adding sugar but you know i don't think sugar is sugar there is coconut sugar which some whole food plant-based no oil people are comfortable with i've done some work uh with rip esselstyn and so i'm very well versed in whole food plant-based no oil cooking and baking you it would be um how can i say this you're not going to get a same result with a muffin made with applesauce or date paste as you will with one that's made with a little bit of fat but that doesn't mean you're not going to get something that's good and there are recipes in essential vegan desserts that are not labeled whole food plant-based no oil they're not labeled gluten-free well if you read the recipe it's going to say that but they are naturally that the fruit the lightly gelled fruit soup and salad that I mentioned to Chef Char when she asked for a low or no sugar dessert is one. That would be very helpful because you're eating fruit and you can do a tofu cream with, um, if you're cutting back on fat and you don't want to use cashews, you can do a tofu cream with some fruit paste and do it fine and do it fine. So Carleen, go for it. It should be fine. Now, Linda's got a follow up here. Could I use my honey instead? Could I use my honey 100 mil instead maple syrup? I really want to use it in the cake mix. Um, Linda, uh, Linda was in the course, in the cohort in 2020. Um, Linda, again, I would have to say that you have to test the recipe. I can't give you a definitive answer, but definitely try it. And write to me. Everybody here is invited to write to me at franatruby.com if you want some further information or have a comment and let me know. Let's see, Gregory has a question. This is an interesting question, Gregory. Gregory is asking for some common added preservatives one can use to make desserts last longer. Well, Gregory, let me know, send another question in, how long is too long? I keep, you know, is long. All of these desserts, vegan desserts that are made with some sweeteners, for example, uh, vegan sweeteners are more humectant than a traditional white sugar-based dessert, so there's moisture. Most of the batter-based desserts are made with liquid fat, and some of you may know. I mean, my training is traditional, and this is what makes me so happy about essential vegan desserts is it's a dessert course for vegan desserts but we have real technique per ruby and so oil-based cakes or cakes batters cookies that are made with a liquid fat are moisture i keep my cakes cookies some frostings ganache in the freezer and i find that is a way to extend the shelf life that's what i do i don't add preservatives so why don't you try that gregory keep your desserts in the freezer if they can be frozen sharon hi sharon that's my friend sharon nazarian who <laughs> used to be my neighbor when we both lived in new york sharon's on long island now i'm in philadelphia and i used to say hey, Sharon, I just made a new dessert. Can you just run right over? And she would to taste it. So Sharon says she loves my chocolate is the answer sign. It is adorable. And it was a gift from Carmela and Carlos who have an all vegan shop here called V Marks the Shop that is phenomenal. So anybody comes to 
Philadelphia, make sure to go to V Marks the Shop. Ruth says, what raw dessert do you recommend? Well, for, you know, for one thing, there are raw, raw desserts or in the style of raw. This is a raw dessert, isn't it? It's fruit. It's a cream that was made with raw cashews. And that is a raw dessert. So are fruit salads. Um, we have a really very popular tart in a tart or a tort, depending on who you're talking to, in essential vegan desserts that is made with a raw crust of dates and nuts and a little bit of spice that gets pressed into a tart pan and then frozen because it's not baked and it has to be chilled. And the filling is made with dates, again, date paste, uh, cacao powder. I am one of the few pastry people who will say that there is no such thing as raw chocolate or raw cacao because during the fermentation process, which is the first thing that happens to the cocoa beans after the machete hacks the pod and the beans are laid out to ferment, the temperature goes higher than is allowable in raw, in true raw dessert. So it's more proper to say unroasted cocoa, but I'm saying cacao, meaning non-alkalized cocoa powder. And it is blended up with some nut butter too. And it's absolutely delicious, sets in the freezer and it's just wonderful. We have a unit on raw desserts in the course. So Ruth, and then of course there are sorbets and ice creams. This time of the year, I love watermelon. Oh my gosh, I just love watermelon. It feels a little early so far, but I like watermelon with lime and a little sprinkle of malt and sea salt. But I do a watermelon granita by chopping up or processing the watermelon and a granita is really a fruit. Well, it's a liquid that you put in the freezer and then just scrape. And then I put some bits of chocolate there to mimic the seeds. So there you go, Ruth. Let's see. Brian says, I recently tried puff pastry for the first time and the dough came out broken and did not rise. I think I overworked it. I'm wondering if the cake flour wasn't strong enough. Puff pastry is a thing. We're talking about laminated dough here, and it's very fresh in my mind because in my building, we have a group of women who are in this wonderful organization called Les Dames de Scoffier, the Philadelphia chapter. Chef Kathy Gold is here, and Chef, Chef Kathy Gold will be the president next year. I'm digressing, but there's a point. And Kathy, Chef Kathy, did a live event about, all about vanilla. So if you're interested in learning about vanilla, go to the live events, the library. But we live also in this building with a legend. Her name is Esther, spelled Esther, but she's French, Esther McManus. And she taught Julia Child to make croissant on television years ago. You can you can Google Esther, Esther McManus, Julia Child, and you can watch and you can learn some things, Brian, about it. But my daughter-in-law was visiting from Los Angeles this week with my granddaughter and they said, do you think Chef Esther will show us how to do puff pastry? And it is a really, it's a process with a lot of turns. And when we were there for four hours, we made one and Chef Esther had to, she made the dough the day before in order to work with it. So Brian, there are so many reasons that your puff pastry didn't rise or came out broken. It has to do with the flour. It had to do with how many turns you did and were they proper. Had to do with the chilling in between and the way you paddled your butter. So just keep trying. Oh, thank you, Patrick. And thank you. There's 
the um, link to Astaire. Connie wants to know what's a good cream substitute. For decades, the cream substitute that was the vegan go-to was coconut, full fat coconut milk or coconut cream. Today we have many different, we have commercial creams. Violife makes a vegan cream that whips just like cream and my friend Dari has made um, cream scones with it that she says is very good. Cashew cream unsweetened is another cream substitute that's very good. So I'm trying to think, there's Violife, I think Silk brand makes a cream substitute as well. I haven't used it. Ruth wants to know what's your opinion of using monk fruit sweetener? Well, Ruth, if you were here a little earlier, you heard me say that I'm not using, I, I have never used those sweeteners. I don't use non-sugar sweeteners. I never believed in them. <laughs> if something is too good to be true, it's usually not true. I use the least amount of sugar and an appropriate sugar. And when sugar, I mean a sweetener possible to get the result that I want. And um, monk fruit, I did, I did a consulting job with a company that was bringing monk fruit to market. And that's not the real name of it. And I don't remember what the real name is now, but it was for a very big company. And it is the actual derivation of the monk fruit has a terrible taste and that's flavor. And that's to keep the birds away from it. It's very, very highly processed. So Ruth, look through the Q&A, find the article on the link to the article on non-nutritive sweeteners from the National Institutes of Health and come back next month if you can when I'm going to talk about this more. Cynthia says, on one of your recent live events, you showed us a chocolate chia pudding you made for yourself. Oh, was the base for the pudding banana, milk, do I recall? Well, let's see. <laughs> it could have been any number of things. I am not a big fan of typical chia puddings. I don't like the kind of gelled consistency, but I think chia has a lot of protein. There's reasons to use chia. And so I might have done a base of a chocolate milk or an oat or an oat blend and put some chia in and then just stirred it up and let it thicken. Um, the base was definitely not banana. I'm guessing because I like bananas out of hand. I am one person definitely in the minority who doesn't care for banana desserts. So I don't remember Cynthia, um, but I will try. I will try to remember. And if I do, send me a note and I'll get back to you. Hi, Belissa. Your kitchen is beautiful. Can you spin the camera around 360? I can't tell you how much I enjoy. Um, well, Belissa is a current student in Essential Vegan Desserts and doing really beautiful work, very enthusiastic, extra work. I really appreciate everyone. We all look, we all learn differently. But, you know, when you make a dish for the first time, it's easier to fix flavors, let's say, in a savory dish. It's more difficult with desserts. And very often, it takes more than one try to get something right. And Belissa is all about that. So I think right before the end, I'll spin this around and you can see it. It's time for me to do an Instagram Live with my kitchen, but it's just amazing. This was a closed room. And if you go back to some of the other live events, you'll see me in my closed kitchen with very dark cabinets. I'm very proud to say that up to the cabinet over my shoulder that's open, those are my original cabinet boxes that were saved. Thanks, Felissa. Um, Anita wants to know, can we replace tamari with soy sauce? Almost oh, definitely. 
Tamari and soy sauce are very similar. Tamari is a wheat-free version of soy sauce. Uh, Elijah wants to know any ideas for fresh papaya. Well, you can just eat it or use it as you do use mango or other fruits like that. You know, for some reason, I don't eat enough. I don't eat or remember to buy enough papaya. But Elijah, I would use it like mango, like melon. I have a nice big cantaloupe ready for me. Hi, Laura. I wondered if you've come across any new interesting vegan milk chocolate to bake with. I just tried Enjoy Life's Rife chocolate chips and they were great, but I keep looking. That's, you know, when I started 30 some odd years ago, it, it, it was a, it was a different world. As you can imagine, we didn't have vegan butter. We certainly didn't have the vegan milks we have today. And we most definitely didn't have vegan milk chocolate. I've had some that weren't very good, but a lot of people are using a lot of manufacturers. A number of manufacturers are using oat milk to make milk chocolate. There's a company called seventh heaven that has, uh, they come out of Israel and they've just launched in this country and the milk chocolate it just reminded me of my childhood they're delicious um i too laura have tasted the enjoy life rice milk and i was very pleasantly surprised it's very good i didn't expect with rice milk that the chocolate would be as good as it was so i think you know this is an instance in the same way as you're going to have to try some recipes by testing, you're going to have to, Laura, you're going to, you and Arnie are just going to have to do a little taste testing is what you're going to do. When you're using milk chocolate though, remember that the percentage of cacao is going to be considerably less than it is in non dairy chocolate, whether it's vegan or not. So you're going to have to adjust. If you're doing a ganache, you're going to have to adjust the proportion. And I hope that helps. And do, you know, let's all share our information because there's only so much one person can taste. That's for sure. I was just gifted with um, some very high end, beautiful box chocolates from a chocolatier in Yardley, Pennsylvania, who had a vegan line. And when I looked, they're gorgeous and delicious. And he's doing all ethical, fair trade, the sugar, the chocolate, everything. And when I looked him up, because this is someone I didn't know, it was a gift, he studied with Chef Jockey from the, our uh, French pastry school at Ruby. So I thought that was very interesting and this week i also had an opportunity to take a tour that was set for les dames de scoffier with at the shane confectionery which is philadelphia's oldest candy store and everything there there was a lot of vegan along with the traditional chocolates they've been making for a long time and everything is ethical and careful. So I think we're definitely going in the right direction. Well, my goodness, the last question, and it's exactly the time to stop. So again, I'm going to thank everyone for coming. Just take an extra minute to remind my students, please join the Facebook group, the private Facebook group for essential vegan desserts. If you haven't already done so, if you're on social media, tag hashtag essential vegan desserts and ruby plants so we can find each other questions of a technical nature write to support at ruby.com uh ask questions about equipment and so on in the facebook group any other questions write to me at fran at ruby.com thank you for coming and i hope i'll see you july 5th to take a deep dive another look at vegan sweeteners. Have a good day, everyone. Take care.